welcome to the exam review of the UK Actuarial Professions CT6 exam paper for September 2016. I'm John Lee, a tutor from ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. In this video, I'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper. If you'd like more detailed solutions, then please refer to our asset, ASET, which stands for ACTED Solutions with Exam Technique, which give both model and alternative solutions as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from our eStore in time for students' preparation for the April 2017 exams. And the paper kicks off with a question testing the bookwork from Chapter 7 on insurable risks. Recall that these were that policyholders should have an interest in the risk, and the risk is quantifiable, and then would also like the risk to be independent, have small probabilities, be pooled, have an ultimate limit, and eliminate moral hazard. However, this question asks us to explain why these policies may not meet the ideal criteria. Simply regurgitating the core reading would not have gained you any marks. Given that there's three marks, you're probably thinking of about three points to make. Since there are only five policies in the portfolio, it's hardly pooled. Policy pays out in the event of rain, which is hardly a small probability. And the couples are getting married on the same day in the same city, means that the claims are hardly likely to be independent. In the second part, you're asked to suggest two ways that the portfolio or policy terms could be changed in order to better meet the criteria for insurable risks. Well, we simply have to undo the problems that we found in part one. Get more policies, ensure that they're on different days in different cities, and maybe change it from rain to something else. As a slight aside, a number of students seem to think that the statement in the notes which says policyholders should have an interest in the risk simply meant that they're interested in buying this insurance. No, we're talking about having a financial interest in the risk, i.e. they're going to lose out. Question 2 is an exceptionally easy question on decision theory from Chapter 1 of the notes and would have presented absolutely no bother whatsoever to well-prepared candidates. In Part 1, you simply have to construct a payoff matrix for a generous two marks, in part two, you have to say which decision functions are dominated, that is, which decision functions have the same or worse payoff in every case. In this question, there were none of them. And in part three, we have to determine the optional strategy under the Bayes criterion. So we simply calculate the expected profit for each decision, and then obviously we'll choose the one which has the greatest expected profit. Question three was a straightforward question on the EBCT Model 1 from Chapter 6 of the Notes. Part 1, we simply have to use the formulae given on page 29 of the tables, and this would have presented absolutely no problem whatsoever to students. In Part 2, we have to comment on why the credibility factor is low. If you looked at the results of your calculation, you would have found that E of S squared theta was much bigger than variance of theta, and this caused a low credibility factor. That is, the average variability for each risk is exceptionally large, and so individual risks are more unreliable, so we should put more weighting on all of the risks together. Question 4 tests the inverse transform method for discrete random variables from Chapter 14 of the Notes. However, given that this was the worst answered on the paper, it seems that students freaked out at the number of words in this question. We're given the probabilities in the table below. Supposing we start with a standard policyholder. At the end of the year, 80% of policyholders will remain in standard and 20% will move to premium. So the algorithm will simply be, we generate a random number u from a uniform 0, 1, and then if u is between 0 and 0.8, we will remain in standard next year. And if u is between 0.8 and 1, we'll move to premium next year. You can do similar algorithms for the other types of policyholder. However, please read the question carefully. Not only do we have to set out three algorithms, one for each possible initial policyholder type, we also need to simulate the policyholder type for the next three years. And so your method would need to clearly explain what you would do in each year. Part two of the question gave you some simulated values from the uniform 0, 1, and you simply had to apply these to your algorithm in part one. So you can find out what type of policyholder they are for the three years and how many claims they made in total. Question 5 on the paper was an interesting mixture of CT3 and Chapter 3 of the notes. 
part one asks us to explain what is meant by a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables. No marks for saying they need to be independent or saying that they need to be identically distributed. You'll have to use words to explain what independent and identical actually mean. Part B asks you to give an example. Please don't say claim amounts because you read it in the next part of the question. Claim amounts are assumed to be IID, but the reality is that they're not. Why don't you choose something which actually is, like rolling a dice? Part two of the question is a quick proof from CT3 using MGFs. If we say that S is the sum of exponentials, then we need to obtain the MGF of S, which will work out to be the product of the MGF of the X's. Part three of the question tests mixture distributions from chapter three. However, the way they ask it might have been confusing. Could it ask you not to obtain the mixture distribution, but the marginal distribution? Let's have a look at what this means. We're told in the question that each claim xi depends on the parameter lambda i, and the lambda i's vary as a gamma distribution. The marginal distribution of the claim amounts is essentially saying we want the PDF of the claims xi, but without the lambdas. We can get this by integrating the joint PDF with respect to lambda. And the joint PDF, that is the PDF of x's and lambdas, equal to the product of the conditional PDF multiplied by the PDF of the lambdas. Substitute in the PDFs, and then either you'll have to use repeated integration by parts, which I wouldn't recommend, or recognize that you have a gamma distribution. Question six, test generalized linear models from chapter 10 of the notes, and is pretty much identical to April 15, question six, and April 12, question seven. Therefore, any well-prepared student will have done this question twice before and should have scored full marks. Part one of the question asks us to determine the Poisson parameter for each risk. Now, risk A has a Poisson distribution with parameter, say, mu A, and you have a sample of five values. Finding the maximum likelihood of this would have presented no problem at all. Once you've done that, do a similar thing for risk B and for risk C. Part two of the question would have been more confusing had you not seen this question before. We're asked to test whether the three risks had the same claim rate using the scale deviances. Recall that the difference in scale deviances is approximately a chi-squared distribution with the difference in parameters. Our model in part one had three parameters, mu a, mu b, and mu c, and we're testing whether they have the same claim rate, i.e. whether they have one parameter mu, and so we'll have a chi-squared two. Recall that the definition of the scale deviance is twice the log likelihood of the saturated model minus the log likelihood of the model that you're looking at. So the difference in the scale deviances between our two models would have been as follows, where log LM1 is the log likelihood of our model that we did in part one, and log likelihood M2 is the log likelihood of the model that we'll have to calculate from scratch, where all risks have the same claim rate, i.e. they all have a Poisson mu. Question seven, test conditional distributions and was the second worst answered question on the exam paper. Part one asks us to obtain the distribution of the reinsurer given that claims are referred to the reinsurer. And many exam questions before have asked us to calculate the mean claims of the reinsurer given that claims are referred to the reinsurer, but you'll have to look all the way back to April 2000, question three, to find the last time that we were asked for the PDF. Now this derivation is given in chapter four in section 1.2, and the formula is the PDF of our distribution will equal the original PDF, but with Z plus M, all over the probability that our claims are more than M. Following through the steps would have actually been an easy four marks had you remembered that formula. Part two of the question asks us to calculate the distribution after all claims have been inflated by a factor of K. Now this was last asked in September 2014, question seven, and is given as an example in section three of chapter four. There are two ways of doing this. One of them is to look at the CDF of our X dash, which is the probability that X dash is less than little X dash. But we know that the claims are all inflated by a factor of K, so X dash will just simply be KX. Rearranging that gives us the probability that X is less than X dash over K. And since we know that the distribution of X is Pareto, we can use the CDF to calculate that probability and observe that you have a Pareto alpha K lambda. Part three of the question says, state the distribution of Z dash, which combines parts one and two. 
Since we know from part two that inflating claims by a factor of k gives us a Pareto alpha k lambda, and in part one, we saw that the conditional distribution added an extra m, this would have given us the following. The final part of the question asks us to comment on whether the average claim amount has increased by a factor of k if the retention limit is unchanged. Well, this is identical to April 2016 question eight, part three. Essentially, claims increase, but not by a factor of k, because a greater proportion of claims have been referred to the reinsurer. Question 8 tests runoff triangles from chapter 11, and this time it's the inflation adjusted basic chain ladder. This question is almost identical to April 2014 question 9, but just has more years. If you remember that inflation can only be applied to incremental figures, and development factors can only be applied to cumulative figures. If you remember that, then the method becomes fairly straightforward. Adjust those incremental figures for past inflation to make them into 2015 prices, accumulate the figures and apply your development factors, and then apply in future inflation, but you'll need the future incremental figures. And so this would have been a very easy 12 marks. Question 9 tests time series from chapters 12 and 13 of the notes, and is identical to September 2012 question 9. Hopefully by now, you'll notice that a number of questions on this paper are simply repeats of previous CT6 questions. I'm sure there's a model here for our students, but I can't quite seem to put my finger on it. Part one of the question asks how we know that we're applying a seasonal difference with factor 12. Look at this factor in the original defining equation. One minus B12, that's a seasonal difference. So presumably we have monthly data and we're simply taking away the month from last year to strip out any seasonality in the data. Once you've done that, all that you'll have left is this part of the equation. It asks us to find the values of alpha and beta so that this seasonally adjusted process will be stationary. You simply have to obtain the characteristic equation of Rxt and then solve it for lambda. And recall for it to be stationary, the lambdas need to be greater than one in magnitude, which would mean that the alpha and beta need to be less than one in magnitude. Part three of the question asks us to estimate the parameters alpha and beta where we're given the sample ACF values. We're going to use method of moments. You'll need to obtain the true values for row one and row two, and then equate these to the sample values of zero and 0 0.09. This shouldn't have been too much bother. The final part of the question asks us to get the next two forecasted values. But don't get caught out. This is for the original series of data, not the seasonally differenced one. The easiest way of doing this would be to simply substitute in the values for alpha and beta in the first equation and then rearrange it. Substituting the values would give us the following and rearranging gives us xt equals 0.09 xt minus 2 plus xt minus 12 minus 0.09 xt minus 14 plus our white noise. You now simply have to substitute in the t plus 1 and the t plus 2 and remember that future white noise terms are estimated to be zero. And the final question on the paper tests ruin from chapter nine of the notes. And by now, you'll be unsurprised to hear that this is very similar to a past paper question. In this case, April 2012, question 11, parts two to four. Part one asks us to define the adjustment coefficient. Many students simply quoted the formula, but forgot to mention that R is the unique positive root and so would have lost some marks. In part two, we have to show that for this portfolio, the value of R is 0 0.00648 correct to three significant figures. Many students correctly obtained the equation, but simply substituted in R is 0 0.00648, notice the answer was roughly zero, and said that's good enough. But this doesn't prove that this answer is correct to three significant figures. Just like in April 2012, what you actually have to do is substitute in 0.006475 and 0.006485. Notice that the sign changes, and so the answer must be 0.006482 to three significant figures. Part three of the question asks us to obtain an upper bound for the probability of ultimate ruin with initial surplus 300. And so all we have to do is simply use Lumberg's equation with the value of R that we were told in part two. Part B of the question asks us to estimate the probability of ruin by time one using a normal approximation. 
So we want the probability that the surplus process is less than zero at time one. Substituting in the formula for that and rearranging, this is equivalent to saying that our claims up to time one must be more than 6050. Find the mean and variance of this using the formula for your compound distribution on page 16 and then use the suggested normal approximation to standardize it. Notice that CT6 does expect you to use interpolation when you calculate the probability. If not, you would have lost some marks. Part 4 of the question asks what happens when beta is reduced to 0.4 from its original value of 0.5. This would increase both the mean and the variance, and so would have increased the probability of ruin. Simply saying it increases the mean and therefore claims are greater isn't enough because premiums would also be greater. And the final part of the question asks us to propose two ways in which the insurance company could reduce our probability of ruin. Looking at the question, we could reduce the premium loading factor or the initial surplus. Some students thought we could change the rate at which claims arise or the distribution of claims. Fortunately, us insurers don't have that kind of control but you could have mentioned taking out reinsurance to get some marks. If you wish to chat with your fellow students about this paper, then feel free to post on our forums at www.actair.co.uk forward slash forums. On the screen now are links to videos from our Stats Refresher course for those who got a CT3 exemption and will need a little bit more help, particularly for those MGF proofs and marginal distributions that we met in this paper. You'll also see a link to a sample unit from our CT6 online classroom if you'd like tuition but are unable to attend our face-to-face -face courses. Hope you found this video helpful and thanks for watching.